Section 4 of The Talking Handkerchief and Other Stories. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Danny Hogger, www.dannyhogger.com. The Talking Handkerchief and Other Stories by Thomas Wallace Knox. In a Shark's Mouth. The shark has a wide range all over the globe principally in the tropics, where he reaches his greatest size. His family has a goodly number of members. The greatest is known as the basking shark, and he attains a length of 40 feet and upward, but is not by any means the most ferocious of the family. The next to him in size, and by far the most dangerous, is the white shark, which is found in all tropics all around the world, but most numerously in the West Indies, on the coast of Africa, and in the Malay archipelago. A great many stories have been told about the white shark, or man-eater, as he is often called, and he may be set down as one of the creatures most dreaded and hated by those who go down to the sea in ships. Sailors are the sworn enemies of the man-eating shark, and never fail to kill him whenever they have the opportunity. He follows ships for the sake of what is thrown overboard. The sailors have a superstitious idea that when he does so, his presence foretells a death on board, and therefore they get rid of him as soon as possible. As he is voracious, he is caught with a hook with comparative ease, and if the line is sufficiently strong, he can be hoisted on board as soon as hooked. More commonly, a rope is secured around his body for hoisting purposes, and as he comes up to the vessel's side, his tail is severed with an axe to prevent his doing damage with it. Then he is swung in on the deck and killed, or, if the sailors are in a sportive mood, they free him again and enjoy his contortions in the water in his attempts to swim without a tail. The shark is pitiless toward them when they are within his reach, and they reciprocate by showing no pity or mercy for the shark. The writer was once on board a ship that was becalmed at sea and surrounded by a dozen or more sharks. One was caught and killed in the manner just described. A second was allowed to go after his tail had been severed, and a third was marked for a still more painful fate. A large brick was heated to a red heat in the galley fire, and then a piece of asbestos packing was wrapped around it as quickly as possible. The brick with its covering was encased in a piece of pork that was tossed overboard, along with several other morsels which the sharks were ready to devour, and it had no sooner touched the water than it was swallowed. It took a few minutes for the heat to come through its covering of asbestos and pork, and during these few minutes the shark swam along his companions and attracted no special attention. But very soon his movement showed the pain he was feeling. He darted violently about, sprang out of the water, dove, rose again, and was evidently suffering intensely. This continued for perhaps half an hour, and ended with the creature turning on his back and dying in the most horrible contortions. The other sharks showed their tender feelings by attacking him before he was fairly dead. They had no compunctions about eating him, or at any rate, they displayed none, for he was devoured before our eyes to the great delight of the sailors. The mouth of the shark is situated on the lower side of his head, in such a position that it is necessary for him to whirl over on his back to seize anything. This necessity of turning over is taken advantage of by pearl divers and others who have occasion to go into the water where sharks abound, and it gives a skillful swimmer a chance to get out of his way while he is performing his somersault. Pearl divers in the waters of Ceylon and the Persian Gulf often kill the shark by means of the large knife which they always carry to aid them in detaching the pearl oysters from the bottom. They dive beneath him and plunge the knife into his body, and whenever he turns to seize the dart to one side and make ready for another blow. Of course, this can only be done by an expert swimmer who is not encumbered with clothing of any sort. These divers work without any garments, and, as they are accustomed to the water from their infancy, they are almost as quick as fish in their movements. One of their methods of fighting the shark is to take a stout stick, about two feet long. Knife and stick are in a belt around the man's waist, and thus equipped, he swims confidently toward his adversary. The shark turns on his back to seize the tempting prey. 
Quick as a flash, the man places the stick upright between the jaws of the monster, and as the ends are pointed, they pierce both the upper and lower jaw when the shark attempts to close upon the obstacle. He cannot get rid of the encumbrance, and he is powerless to bite. The diver may attack and kill him as leisurely as he likes, for with his mouth thus fixed in an open position, the creature cannot even make his escape by swimming away, for the simple reason that he cannot swim. A man must be very skillful in the water to be able to kill a shark after this method, as it requires the most perfect self-possession to put the stick in its proper position and at the right moment. On a steamer which I was once a passenger, there was a man who had lost his right foot and went around with a pair of crutches. He was a Frenchman who had gone to the East Indies in his younger days and was said to be a wealthy merchant in one of the principal ports of Asia. Naturally, the other passengers were curious to know how he had lost his foot, and their curiosity was all the greater when, in answer to a question on the subject, he briefly said, it was bitten off. He showed no intention of gratifying their desire to learn more on the subject until one afternoon when the conversation had become interesting through the narration of adventures of travel and hunting in various parts of the world. Something was said about sharks and it led to several stories, some of which were certainly a good deal exaggerated. They seemed to rouse the Frenchman and when the last narrator had paused, our friend of the crutches and a single foot said, I'll tell you a story about a shark I had a fight with, and he's the one that bit off my foot. Of course, we were all silent at once, as everybody wanted to know how he had suffered his mutilation. He allowed us to remain so for a minute or two, and then he began. About ten years ago, I went up to the Persian Gulf, on a pearl speculation, along with a countryman from Bombay. We had a schooner loaded with an assorted cargo of the kind of goods suited to the trade, and, as we were considerably in advance of the other spectators, we did a good business as long as it lasted. The divers bring up the oysters that contain the pearls, and then heap them on the shore to rot. And such a stench as these rotting oysters make it would not be easy to match in other part of the world. When the oysters are turned into a decaying, or rather a decayed mass, they are dumped into a trough and washed through men's fingers and great care must be taken to save all the small pearls. But that hasn't anything to do with the scoundrel that bit off my foot. The sharks hung about the oyster beds and hardly a day passed without one being seen, and sometimes every diver that went down reported one or more. Several of the man-eaters were killed, and we began to think the beds were free from them, as none had been reported for two or three days. Our schooner was anchored a mile or more from shore, as the water where we were was very shallow, and, besides, we were more convenient to the fishermen than if we had been nearer to the land. We went back and forth in a native boat as we found it much cheaper to hire one of these crafts than to keep a part of a crew waiting to row us about. It was not always easy to find a boat when we wanted it, but on the whole we got along very well. One afternoon, my partner and I were coming ashore, and I had got about midway from the schooner to the land, when one of the boatmen suddenly called out that an enormous shark was right ahead of us. He pointed in the creature's direction, and my eyes followed the motion of his finger. The shark evidently saw the boat and concluded that he would get beneath it, on the chance that something edible might be dropped overboard. My curiosity got the better of my caution. I was so anxious to see the great monster that I forgot that the boat was very cranky, and the least motion from one side to the other made an upset quite possible. I lost my balance in leaning over the side, and almost before I was aware of it was in the water and right below me was that enormous shark. My head was covered with a sola tope, or sun hat, one of those pith and cloth contrivances worn by nearly every European in Asia, and by no means unknown in other parts of the world. It came off my head as I touched the water, or possibly fell off just before I tumbled. Anyway, it must have caught the shark's eye before anything else, as he went for it without a moment's hesitation. He whirled on his back and crunched the innocent hat between the great jaws as you have seen a dog crunch a chicken bone. He was not long in discovering what a poor article of food it was as he quickly turned his attention from the hat to its owner. I thought my last moment had come. I was not an expert swimmer and besides was encumbered by my garments. Though the latter really made no difference to a man who could not move more quickly than I in the water. 
I made only one or two strokes with my hands before the shark seized me by the foot and dragged me beneath the surface. A hundred pounds to the man who saves him, my partner shouted to the boatman in their own language in which he was proficient. A hundred pounds to one of those boatmen would be like 10,000 to anybody in England or America. It was enough to take great risks to get it. Amodau, the chief of the boatmen, was a skillful pearl fisher and boasted that he had killed many a shark while pursuing his occupation. The offer of a hundred pounds was a stimulus that set him in motion instantly, and hardly were the words out of my partner's mouth before the honest Amadou was over the side of the boat with his knife gripped between his teeth. In the clear water of the gulf he could see a long distance, and a dozen vigorous strokes brought him to the side of the shark that was dragging me away. They not only brought him at the side of, but under the shark, and the next instant the knife was plunged to the hilt in the creature's vitals, making him release his hold on my foot. Two or three times, and very quickly too, the knife was plunged, and then Amadou turned his attention to me. I was more dead than alive, and when he brought me to the surface I fainted, so that he was obliged to support all of my weight. Had another shark happened along at that moment, one of us would certainly have become his prey. I was lifted into the boat. The water I had taken into my lungs was expelled by the customary expedients used upon persons in a drowning condition, and after a while I recovered. My foot was crushed into a shapeless mass and could not be saved. It was amputated by a young doctor on board an English ship, then in the gulf. And in course of time, I was restored, as you now see me. How long were you under water? One of the listeners asked. I don't think it was over two minutes, was the reply. From the time the shark pulled me down until Amadou had me at the surface, the whole thing was done so quickly that it would have seemed very much like a dream had it not been for the terrible reality of the loss of my foot and the sensation of being in the grasp of a shark. That is something nobody could ever forget. Certainly I can never forget it if I live to be a hundred years old. Then the Frenchman excused himself and hobbled away to his room. Another of the party told how he had seen a shark blown up with gunpowder, very much in the same way that his fellow was killed with red hot brick. A small can of powder with a lighted slow match attached to it was embedded in a piece of pork and thrown over a ship which was followed by a large shark. He swallowed the pork with its explosive cargo and... The rest of the story tells itself. End of section four. Recorded by Danny Hogger. www.dannyhogger.com.